Well, the media is regarded as the most trusted institution whose output in information is nearly or always consumed with less questioning. Let me wonder the title, The Fourth Estate, an addition to the three European estates that then existed. But with the advent of new media, the media, a discipline that survives on verification, has come under sharp criticism. So we ask how has fake news or fake media, if that will be a term, affected what otherwise will be described as a traditional media. Good morning and welcome to Newsroom, a show that talks about the media, critiques the media just as we do to others. Welcome to the broadcast. I'm Abu Bakr Abdullahi. I have a set of panelists. Four to my immediate left is Eric Mugendi, the managing editor, Pesa Czech, Vincent Gave, deputy editor, Kenya, Africa Czech, Anne Wangige, you'll tell me if I'm getting that pronunciation correctly, my deputy editor, Pesa Czech, Anne Gengeri. Yes. Good. And uh, Leo Mutisia, the manager, partnership and stakeholders engagement, uh, the media monitoring and research, of course, from the Media Council of Kenya. No. Ladies and gentlemen, many thanks for making time for us this morning. Thank, thank you. Much. Much. And thank you for <laughs> accepting our invites and welcome to TV 47. Okay. The very mention of fake news often puts the media under sharp focus. Mm -hmm. Is the media under a threat from fake news? Let me start with you. I don't think so. I don't think fake news per se mm -hmm. is a threat to the media because the, the factors that have led to the rise of fake news have largely resulted from the media basically taking a, a back seat when it comes to the sharing of information. So I would say the main reason why misinformation or fake news has become such a problem is because the ways that we're consuming information are changing. So it's up to the media to basically keep up with where the people are and uh, how we're consuming information so that that way we can ensure that we're not being fooled. Let me get your entire thoughts on that, mm -hmm. uh, Vincent. I think it's an opportunity for the media to sharpen skills that they need and to enhance their ability to fact check and verify. Um, because uh, really when you talk about even the word, you know, fake news, it's, it's this political constructed word. I mean, really that term includes so many things that it doesn't really represent what's happening. Yeah, because it, it is used for, you know, to describe everything from propaganda to advertising to bad journalism and even the false news. So um, without uh, that proper understanding of what we are looking at, we can't really, you know, solve our problem of misinformation. But no, I don't think it's a threat as such. It's not a threat, you say, Anne? Yeah, I also don't think it is a threat. I just think that uh, mainstream media needs to keep up with the changes that are happening. Like you've mentioned, uh, new media. So the public is um, consuming uh, information from other uh, platforms, not necessarily the mainstream media. So we have social media platforms and all that. So I think it is important for them to keep up and make sure that they fact check and verify everything that is on those platforms. Fair enough. Um, Leo? Yeah, I seem to agree with everyone. Um, but the, the, the answer to that lies in the word manage. How do you manage fake news as an editor in a media house? How do you deal with fake news? And I think the answers have been provided here, and especially talking about more and more presence in research, more and more presence in social media, mm -hmm. uh, verifying and following the setup uh, ethics that are there uh, regarding to media. And I think the most important one is investment. How do you compete with a very vibrant social media? Because he's talking about the ways that we consume media has changed. The ways that public consumes media have changed. So the media, mainstream media in that regard needs to reinvent itself. And you know, now we are talking about only five bureaus. In this, around five bureaus in this country, some of, this, some of which are defunct, are not functioning anymore. How do you verify? How does a journalist in Trukana, for example, mm -hmm. verify fake news from Nairobi that Loboso is dead? Are you going to uh, keep calling your editor in Nairobi to verify this? Because we don't have access to these resources. So it will be a threat if we don't manage. If the, if the four of you are in agreement that the media is not under a threat from fake news, and every time we hear of fake news, with people question the media. Mm. Isn't that not an irony? That there is fake news, yet the media is being questioned. 
yet you all agree <laughs> that the media is not under a threat. The credibility when questioned surely sounds like a threat, doesn't mm -hmm. it? It does, yeah. So I would say the fact that people are questioning the media, it shows like, because uh, Kenya has one of the most vibrant media environments in the region. Mm -hmm. Like we actually have the ability to question some of the things that we're seeing. But what we've seen increasingly is that the media is taking a passive role in the sharing of this information. So people are not able to, uh, people are actually able to question some of the things that they're seeing because the, there's this open space. Because when you have uh, situations where the media is like heavily controlled by the government, mm -hmm. what, whatever they say is taken to be fact and you can't question it. And I honestly think that uh, the media right now needs to take a more explanatory role. Like, instead of fighting with bloggers or Twitter users to break stories, mm -hmm. they should be giving context. They should be explaining, what does this actually mean for you as an ordinary citizen? Which I honestly think the media is perfectly placed to do. But the fact that the, the emphasis now is on who is the first to break a story, and then once a story has broken, there's no further reporting, there's no day two, day three, that I think is very questionable. Leo, let me ask you this question. I was reading an article on Al Jazeera a little bit earlier. The title of that article is How Kenya is Becoming the Latest Victim of Fake News. The writer, Nanjira Sambuli, writes that I quote, Now everyone who has an internet connection can tell their story, mm. their version of events, and connect with right. audience that may be inclined to agree or disagree with them. By so doing, they create debates and even create consensus. This surely is not far from when everyone has a right to post whatever they want at their own leisure. Mm -hmm. yes. And that is regarded as a source of information to the public. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that put the media to question? If at all, then anyone can write whatever they want, and that is regarded as a piece of information. Yet the media's role is to inform. It is, it is the freedom um, of expression that is very clearly defined in the Constitution. There is nothing much you can do about it. And mm -hmm. we cannot start limiting these freedoms because we know if you start limiting these freedoms, you'll be taking this country back to a place where no one wants to go. The idea of sharing information uh, for me online uh, is, is not a threat. It becomes a threat when you have uh, politicians hiring bots when you have politicians hiring people to spread uh, fake information, misinformation, and false information, falsehoods for that matter. And it's going to increase as we get up towards 2022. If there's going to be a referendum, it's going to be worse. Mm -hmm. And, and, and therefore, um, uh, w w what we need to do is to, to you know, to have uh, uh, partnerships and collaborations among various organizations that are involved in debunking fake news so that we can uh, beef support to mainstream media because at the end of the day, Mona Inchi is referencing mainstream media to confirm whatever is being published on social media. And, and do you think the media is seeking those partners in as far as debunking fake news is concerned or there's, there's a standalone? I think there are conversations that we're having as the Media Council of Kenya. I mean, uh, the Media Council of Kenya is the custodian of media freedom uh, in a way. We are also the custodians of freedom of expression to a, a larger extent, and also the, partly the custodian of access to information. One of the reasons why people, and especially journalists, share information which is half-baked is because they are also incapable. They are unable to access the right information that they can share mm -hmm. to the public, and therefore that limits the amount, in, amount of information that you are. And that's why you find that today in the print media, there is so much at reliable sources, according to reliable sources, because we are, really, media is unable to confirm some of these things. Of course, then there is the, the journalistic code of conduct mm -hmm. uh, that every journalist has to adhere to. The various principles of fairness, actually. Ideally, they should adhere accountability, to, but that's and, not the case always, is and, it? And therefore, that, that dif differentiates journalism from any other blogger, any other media that we talk about. Because again, bloggers are not accredited uh, as uh, according to the Code of Ethics. Vincent, before I yes. allow, <coughs> allow you to respond to that, let me ask Anne this question. Anne, mm -hmm. the rush to break the news, does it neighbor the rush of faking it? Well, if you rush to break a story before you have confirmed its authenticity, of course, when the, the facts come out and it turns out that you are wrong, you're really going to suffer as a brand. So it, is, it does affect, because now people will um, assume uh, you are doing this, you have an agenda, you're not reporting the facts. Yet as uh, mainstream media, there's a lot of trust that is bestowed upon you by the public. So I think it would be more important for you to play your role as um, do your 
fact checking and verification, verify the information before you can uh, break it. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Vincent, you earlier telling me off air that if it's not verified, don't post it, don't mm -hmm. share it, yes. don't don't put it on a publication. Mm -hmm. Yes, but that's not always the case. I mean, it, it does. You do see people rushing to publish before. Uh, you know, verifying, mm -hmm. and we see the results of that later. Mm -hmm. They get proven wrong. And that means that credibility takes a hit. And while I would say that what we, what we don't have, I wouldn't call it a threat. I think what the real threat is, mm -hmm. is the fact that revenue has moved online. You know, Facebook and Google in particular have hoovered so much advertising revenue that there's really less money in the, in the legacy you know, newspapers. That's a problem. The challenge for media, as far as fact-checking is <coughs> concerned, has to be that they have to work more with their readers. Because before, journalists were gatekeepers. Now we have to reach out more. That means asking your readers, have you heard of this? Tell us about it. You know? Is this event happening? Reach out to us and get that camaraderie with your users so that when they get something that they suspect is false or that they don't understand, they immediately send it to you. That's one thing. So you get, uh, you have your finger properly on the pulse as to what is happening and you're not, um, you're not disconnected with the ground. That's very important. The second thing is that it's building on what Eric said about explanatory journalism. One way to do that is to explain what certain news stories mean to you. Mm -hmm. But the other way, which mm -hmm. is now very important for our credibility and uh, for our survival as journalists, mm -hmm. is to tell our readers how we came up with the story. And for a curious audience that wants to know what has happened mm -hmm. at what time, yes. would they be really interested in a lengthy explanatory piece? than just knowing a, a, click in, a clickbait headline <laughs> of no, what has happened. I mean, I mean you, can, you, you don't have to, you, you, you know, the, the, the formats have their demands, yeah. right? The formats have their demands. But you can tell people exactly what you know at that point. Mm. You can tell them what the implications are. You can tell them what you're doing to confirm. Um, and you can tell them that you're following something and that you are going to get back to them. So, so that you don't... Uh, you don't feel that you know you can go with something, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because you think that's the story. Even when, for example, you're thinking that something big is going to happen, say you're looking for certain information from a government office, it is just as important to tell your readers that these are the steps we have taken mm -hmm. to get this information for you. We called this person, he didn't reply. Whether you have been given the information or, or not. Or not, uh -huh. or not. We called this person, mm -hmm. he didn't reply. Mm -hmm. We emailed them five times, they didn't get back to us. That telling your readers that you have put in the work, that's very important for uh, building trust. Fair enough. Leo, you want yeah. to respond to yeah. that? Yeah. Plus, I, mean I want to ask you a question yeah. on the speculativeness of the stories that mm -hmm. we read mm -hmm. on papers and mm -hmm. also the stories that are aired. Mm -hmm. Journalists at times mm -hmm. fall to the trap. We as the media fall to the trap of speculating. Mm. We, we play around numbers and see the possibilities and report mm. on the possibilities. Mm. Is there anything wrong in that? There's something wrong with that. And, and before I go to that, let me, let me just uh, uh, put more weight on what they're saying about explanatory journalism, the explaining news. Mm. And what we are doing as a media council, we offer something called media information and literacy uh, mm. programs, whereby we take editors to the field, to the ground, to talk to the public and explain how they go about determining what is going to be aired at the end of the day, so that the public can start understanding mm -hmm. how news is produced at the mainstream media and how then you can keep... Uh, you and know, you say you take editors? We take editors with that to the, to the, to the ground, uh -huh. to the villages, to Yet the Yet largely the, the people who are reporting on these are reporters. No, no, you see, who feed the, editors yes, who are on desk. Yes, yes, and the final <laughs> Just person... Just to be fair. Yeah, see, mm -hmm. let me tell you uh, why we take editors. According to law and according to the Media Council Act, it is the editor who bears the biggest responsibility. Even on advertisements today, 
It is the editor who does uh, take that responsibility. And therefore, it is the editor who, when they receive a report, it goes to the sub-editor before mm -hmm. it goes to the final editor. And therefore, through that chain, somebody is supposed to determine and dis decide that this story is either manufactured or it is real mm -hmm. by also talking to the reporter and also trying to collaborate it, uh, collaborate it uh, from various other sources. But in, in, term, in, in the question of speculativeness that is happening in the media, mm -hmm. one of the articles we released the Media Observer yesterday night, mm -hmm. and one of the articles, the first article actually in the Media Observer is talking about what we are calling the, um, the journalism of the future of I, I think that is the concept that has been advanced by the futuristic, the journalism. futuristic this journalism. This will happen, this and, may and, happen. And, this mm. will happen, this mm. will happen. And it, it basically centered around the, uh, the appointment of uh, Yatan mm -hmm. as the acting uh, finance cabinet yes. secretary. Yeah. And, and, and you're asking yourself, uh, the day before the media was speculating and, you know, looked confident uh, 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 trying to identify the people that president is going to appoint and yeah. saying that so and so is going to be appointed because of various reasons that they were giving and mm -hmm. so and then all of a sudden the president doesn't appoint them and I saw one one of the in one of the WhatsApp groups of uh, journalists one of the uh, 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 an editor was like hey the president has let us down on this one <laughs> <laughs> after the appointment <laughs> after the appointment of your turn now <laughs> so it is clearly yes. is letting us down fair it enough is, and they may yes. have gotten wrong mm. yes if they wouldn't have done that the audience would have been on the media's neck saying they can't analyze the scenarios, deduce on no, how no, things are happening. But how do you analyze? You analyze by calling people like Vincent to come to TV to mm. give opinions mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, to pressure that, or, but not journalists themselves giving their own opinion yeah. mm -hmm. because that is what happened. And mm -hmm. that is something that we are very concerned about as a media council of Kenya, by the mm -hmm. way. Yeah. And uh, are we as journalists then failing to write our own opinions at the opinion pages and write news stories in the news pages? Well, I think uh, the risk uh, is that as a journalist, if you start giving opinions, it may be taken as you're speaking on behalf of the publication. It is very hard now for you to be mm. considered objective, which you're supposed to be as a journalist. Mm -hmm. So if you write an opinion, uh, you work for, let's say, TV 47, mm -hmm. it is going to be very hard to detach what you're saying as um, uh, your individual, your pers personal opinion, and what your publication or your organization stands for. So I think there's a risk of coming off as a subjective. Yeah, Vincent? Yeah. Um, on the question of speculation yes. and, and trying to get uh, the story in advance, I think um, what would have been important to make clear mm -hmm. was that, you know, here is who we think may. Mm -hmm. In other words, you have to make the uncertainty clear. And that applies really to all journalism, where or all situations where you're working with imperfect information. Mm. You have to make clear to your readers that here are the things we don't know. Mm -hmm. However, here are some people who may. So you're telling your your readers that you know if it, it could be these people or it could not be. Mm. But if you wanted now to come across as someone who is um, you know, you're, you're in search of an exclusive, mm -hmm. and you're trying to say that we know for sure it's going to be this person, you've probably made your phone calls around people who you think know, or who are in the know. Mm -hmm. But even in that situation, I mean, we've seen, um, especially around matters of not just uh, public appointments, but also law enforcement, sometimes they keep the secrets very tight, and they don't say. Mm. So if they deliberately say that this is not coming out, then you can't, you see, you can, instead of now s telling people the wrong thing, you can be upfront and tell your readers, you know, the information around this has been kept very tight. Mm -hmm. You can say that. And if your competitor is pointing fingers, giving a tight end answer mm -hmm. to a question, yet you, on this other end, are giving may or may not. You have to trust yourself. You have to say that's the approach they have taken, mm -hmm. and they, they will live and die based on that. Mm -hmm. Right when it comes out, you know, because it, it's all revealed when the appointment happens. Yeah. And if they get it wrong, their mistakes. You know, they say that we, you know, journalists publish their mistakes for the world to see. Yes. This will be one such mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough, uh, Eric. Mm. Fake news and journalistic errors. Yeah. What often is the difference in that? So it's intent. So fake news has to have some malicious intent behind it. Or because a lot of the times, because we're all human beings, we make errors all the time. 
But if you, for example, spread malicious or false information with the intent of actually causing harm, then that's where it becomes like almost weaponized. Because that's the definition that we're going with in terms of defining, uh, what, fake news defining what fake news mm -hmm. is. Because when you try to figure out what the intent is behind this information being shared, because uh, a lot of times what we've seen is information can be shared in error when someone says something in, um, or someone misspoke. Mm -hmm. But then when you look at that, uh, the, uh, the way it's framed, for example, someone can like, give half a headline in the hope that they're going to lure you as a reader to read that article. And then other times you will see people basically just flat out lie because they hope to influence a certain decision. So uh, it crosses from just your average lie because we do understand journalists get things wrong a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it does become, when it does get like a malicious intent, that's when it becomes actual false information. The that intent is being aside, revised. if a journalist gets an information wrongly yeah. and there is an error, yeah. does that equate fake news? Not necessarily. Because. But there's nothing true to it. Y even though, okay, but that's where like correction policies come in. Mm -hmm. If a journalist gets a story wrong, they're meant to now come out and say, we got this wrong. Like if you misspelled my name or you gave me like a completely different name, you call me Geoffrey for some reason, mm -hmm. that's an error. You haven't spread false information, but if you then come out and say, we erroneously referred to this individual by this name, then that's fine. Fair enough. Uh, Vincent? Um, I mean, as you said, corrections are important. Mm. And, and I think that in our space, particularly among uh, you know, a lot of people who post on social media, it is not everybody who publishes a correction, and this is very important. And I think it's a good time to emphasize and re-emphasize that people who post corrections when they get things wrong enhance their credibility, because people know that you are taking being correct seriously. Um, if you get something wrong and you don't publish a correction, and, you know, social media being what it is in this country, People find out. We always do. Mm -hmm. And now you're left in a very uncomfortable situation because you dare not, because, you know, you, uh, you know, we, 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 everyone on Twitter seems to think they're, they're a brand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, 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 so we can't be, we can't be admitting to mistakes. Mm -hmm. We can't be doing such things. We are perfect. But we're, we're all perfect. <laughs> but you see, no matter what people say, you know, inside them, you, it is a fact as to whether they believe you or not. And if they don't, even if mm -hmm. they don't tell you about it, you've lost the credibility mm -hmm. battle. It's very important to post corrections. We see you know, the daily newspapers do it, uh, some websites do it, but it's a very good way because it shows that you value the truth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, one, one will easily say, carry the lie on the front page, yeah. put the truth in the seventh uh, ninth page. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> and, uh, and on the same question, if a journalist makes a mistake mm. that results mm. to a misleading information. Mm. That information is not true. Mm. How then is it not fake news if you think it is not? Let mm. me not put words into your mouth. <laughs> that was Eric's <laughs> response. Yeah, I think, like Eric mentioned, there's a difference between fake news and misinformation. Because fake news is where you outrightly lie and you know you're lying even before you click the post button. But misinformation, sometimes you, do not, you did not intend to mislead or to lie. You wrote a story or you know, um, uh, recorded a clip, aired it, and thought it was factual. Then it turns out it is not. That is misinformation. You did not have the intention to mislead. Mm -hmm. But it has not turned out it is false. So it is very important to own up to that mistake, as Vincent has said. Give like an editor's mm. note, we have since learned this and this is false. It really maintains your credibility as a brand. Because mm. when you just like let it slide, people will not forget. Something mm. else will happen and be like, ah, it's the same guy who shared this thing. And you know, how true now is what he's saying, mm. he or she is saying now. And it also like is damaging to also the brand you represent as a journalist. Because mm -hmm. now that's how you have the term, the very media. It's not about just one person. Now you're all grouped as, mm -hmm. yes. So it's very important. Leo, your thoughts function. on the same question? Um, can, go ahead, can we pick the example of uh, Jimmy? Mm -hmm. Or Jiggy? Mm -hmm. The advertisement on, yeah. the, on, the, on, the, on the Daily Nation mm -hmm. that uh, was uh, deemed to be a mistake. Um, um, somebody entered and illegally placed an advertisement um, in the newspaper. And normally, like he said, first, the intent. Is there an intention of spreading fake news? 
and, and that's what is the, that is the differentiation between mm -hmm. fake news and uh, the errors that we commit. But again, mm -hmm. we say as a regulator and as a media council is mm -hmm. that then you have to be able to explain, to give a story behind the error. Mm -hmm. What did you do that went wrong? And that's what uh, Daily Nation did the following day. They published and showed us pictures of what happened, the guy who came in mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, placed the advertisement and so on. And they timed, the timing was so perfect in such that everybody was rushing out and they, they were about to go to print and so on and so forth. If then you are able to give that kind of plausible explanation, mm -hmm. then we are going to buy it. But then we are also going to ask you to issue an apology yeah. in the same paper, in the same equal measure. So that then we don't have to go to court, and that's that's the thing about journalism, the spirit of journalism. That yeah. it's a, it's a co-regulation model where everybody takes a responsibility. If you realize that you've done a mistake, and for the sake of your brand, like she's saying, then go ahead, please, and apologize. If then you don't apologize, we are going to come for you. People will come for you. The the courts will come for you, and somebody is going to take you to we court. We, in for reference that. to the Media Council of yeah. Kenya, but <laughs> not uh, so we need to Just, take a short break okay. here on Newsroom. We'll be back with this discussion after this break. Stay tuned. Don't go too far. Sasa. Nipe countdown. Two, one. Na kuletea matangazo moja kwa moja kutoka kongamano la sita la ugatuzi hapa Kirenyaga County. Hapa ni mjini meru. Tupo katika neo la wetevi ya county ya kiambu. Hivi leo tuko Nairobi Cinema. Hapa ni kina. Ukipenda kina ngo. Kama huyu amekuataa, tafuta mwingine na Maisa Isonge mbele. Mabadiliko haya yangali yanazua msuke msuke baina ya washika dau. Baadhi ya changamoto hizo zilikuwa ni kama vile ukosefu wa maarifa. Wameweza kupeperusha bendera ya Kenya. Tutaingia kwenye mapumziko kidogo. Chavi! Na hii mpenzi mtazamaji ndio TV47 Macho na sauti yetu Uhuru, sheria na haki ni vipengele muhimu katika maisha ya kila siku. Na iwapo serikali itafanikiwa katika makuzi ya jamii iliyo na mwelekeo basi sharti sheria hizo zifuatwe. Na kwa sababu sheria ni msumeno kukata mbele na nyuma, ni vema kufahamu chungo hizi. Siku zote jambo usilolijua ni kama usiku wa giza. Ungana nami Clifford Ndubi. Nami Andrean Kilemi. Kila siku ya jumatatu saa moja jioni tukidonoa na kuchanganua sheria hizi zinazo tudhibiti.
Welcome back to Newsroom. Thank you for choosing us and staying with us here on TV 47. And before we continue with the studio discussion that we are having this morning on the banking fake news, let's now cross over to the Kenya Human Rights Commission that is releasing an anti-corruption report. Let's listen in to that, the details of that report. When, when the police are coming after you and you Kenya's history means it's not so much the military as it is police, 
services and intelligence services, and it changes from country to country. In countries where they've had liberation struggles, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Angola, etc. The military is a lot more prominent. In countries like Kenya, intelligence services are a lot more uh, prominent. Around the world, one sector that has become essential to the way corruption, and I've been following this for 25 years, the key sector now networks uh, across the planet, it used to be, we used to focus on the politicians, uh, because they kind of, uh, here in Africa we, we had people like Mobutu, Sese Seko, a colorful character, you know, uh, Omar Bongo in Gabon, uh, these leaders would behave in bizarre and colorful ways, uh, that has changed. that are coming over the next 10 years, next decade, are not going to come from Africa. We will have our usual, you know, run of the mill. You, know, you always have to have a scandal here, here or there. We've seen, especially around elections, but the big scandals will come out of the West, uh, and especially out of relationships that mesh the service sector, banks, law, uh, etc. Of the issue and the dumping stopped. 
immediately. Um, I am not. I am not suggesting that as some as a way to deal with things in the Kenyan context. Um, but also just uh, uh, illustrating the, the extent to which. Well, that is anti-corruption crusader John Gidongo. They are giving his statement. Remember, that is the release of the anti-corruption report by the Kenya National, the Kenya rather, Human Rights Commission. We'll give you the details of that report in our subsequent bulletins and join our reporters who are covering that story a little bit later. Now, let's get back to the studio discussion that we are having. Good that it was a journalist who spoke. Little wonder we are talking of fake news here as well. Mm -hmm. uh, before we went for a break, we talked of the intent. Isn't it not difficult to then establish the intent mm. of an information before it is even posted? It, okay, it has to be shared first for us to sort of look into what the intent of the person sharing this information is doing. Mm -hmm. But I think at some level we're hoping that people are acting in good faith when they're sharing this information. But that's why like, we come in as fact checkers when we have reasonable doubt, when we think that some of the things that they're saying are being said with uh, that malicious intent, mm -hmm. so that now when it comes to looking for the data that we can use to check this information, mm -hmm. we can move fairly quickly and sort of issue a response saying whatever they've said is false. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Vincent, earlier on you alluded mm -hmm. to the point of the media houses needing to invest to fact check. Yes. What is the importance to a layman who is watching us, who doesn't understand how the media operates? Yes. What is the importance of a media house investing in fact checking? It's very important because we have to make sure that we are not only verifying you know, things that people say. Fact checking is, is broad, right? That's why it, it cannot be an ad hoc process. It's not something you can do on the side. And uh, I think that just by explaining how we at Africa check, check facts, I think it helps us understand the work that goes into it. Because if you were to go to a rally somewhere mm -hmm. and certain politician says something about number of jobs created or um, like the, the state of the devolution speech that the head of uh, the, the chairman of the Council of Governors made recently, mm -hmm. Wycliffe Oparanya. So you talk about we have invested so much in agriculture, for example. The very first thing we do is to go to their representatives <coughs> or even the governor himself, if you can reach him and say, where, where does this data come from? Okay? If it is in uh, a fairly obvious place, you know, so the economic survey or some uh, funding law, mm -hmm. um, you know, Re uh, Revenue Act, for example, you know, a county allocation of Revenue Act, Division of Revenue Act, then you know where to look. You don't necessarily have to go disturbing him, you know where to look, so you just go and look there. Mm -hmm. But once you do that, then you are able to now find, you know, what the truth is. In cases where it's something different, it can be something a bit less obvious, the first thing to do is to go and ask that person who said whatever they said, mm -hmm. where did you get your figures from? And then they will tell you, some cases they will tell you, I, I got it from this document, I got it from that document. Sometimes they won't tell you anything. Which we agree is a lengthy process at times. Yes. yes. In a 24-hour news setup that is always in the rush mm -hmm. of filling an airtime, filling a paper, do you think that really is an ideal to them? What you do in that situation mm -hmm. is, remember, you, ha you go back to what I said earlier. You tell your readers that you asked him for evidence, he didn't tell you. You tell your readers that we are looking for this information. Or you tell your readers that, you know, when he was when we asked to confirm this information, he did not tell us where he got it from. Tell your readers that, mm -hmm. right? Because that's important. Because what we find from doing fact-checking work is that when people suspect they will be checked, they get more careful. And we have seen this over time. When they know that... Fact more than when it just appears yes. as a news story of yes. two minutes, no, 30 when, seconds. When, when a newsmaker uh -huh. does not think he's going to be fact-checked, mm -hmm. they're more likely to say their own things. Yeah. But when they have gotten a call from a fact checker who asked them, where did you get this? And then we publish a report saying that what they said was incorrect. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now they know that there are people actually looking and checking. Mm -hmm. They take more time. They actually make more of an effort to get the actual numbers. So this is very important because 
in terms of fact checking, what we want, what I would want as a fact checker, mm -hmm. is not necessarily to go and keep telling politicians so and so that he's, he's not telling the truth. Mm -hmm. That's just necessary. If the truth is not told, what we want is for them to tell the public the correct thing so that we all get the correct information and benefit. Fair enough. Yes. And as a preamble to this discussion, I said a statement that this is uh, a, a field that has thrived on verification, a discipline that has thrived on verification. Is alluding to the point that when someone is being fact-checked, they are more serious. Mm -hmm. Which begs the question then, are journalists foregoing the role of fact-checking? Um, I think you have to like strike up a, a, a balance, not just to break the story. You also now need to play the role of a fact-checker. Because you do not want, like I had mentioned, you do not want to put the wrong information out there. Because it will damage you as an individual and your organization as a brand. So it is very important for you to get the facts right, so that you not only correct them, but you also inform the public. For those who had not yet um, um, come across the false information, they will now know the actual fact. Surely it did not be the primary responsibility of a journalist to, in the beginning, mm. check the facts before they post. It should it is. Ideally. Yeah. 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 I think yeah. it's been written for some time now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, is, it's, it actually is, and um, mm. I mean, I was going to also res to respond, or not to respond, but uh, to, en to enhance it and contribute to, to it. Mm. Because news uh, production is a, is a process, it's a long process which involves um, multiplicity of players, mm. uh, including the sources, the journalists, the reporter, the sub editor, and the editor. We're always blaming the sub editor because the sub editor is supposed to do the donkey work mm. and ensure that, you know, even the grammar is correct and is checked and cross-checked before it goes to the editor for authorization. And therefore, the, the, the question of intent is also can also be measured from the beginning in the journalistic perspective of the ethical expectations. Uh, I mean, I, I'm talking as a media council here, mm -hmm. because uh, like I said from the beginning, we are going to want to establish where you came from with that story. And if you are talking about um, uh, sources that you cannot measure, do they meet the threshold, mm. you know? So, so, so that at the end we'll measure the whole process. How did you, uh, you know, get to that point? And also that, let's not forget that a journalist is somebody who is supposed to be trained in media law, in media ethics. So that by the time you become a journalist, you are also accredited by the media council because that's what the law has set up to mm -hmm. do. Uh, you are accredited by the media council and therefore the media council has confirmed that you have received the basic minimum training to allow you and authorize you to be a journalist. Forget mm -hmm. about the social media and the, the bloggers and the, and the other guys out there. We are, as the media council, we are still working on mechanisms of trying to bring bloggers mm -hmm. into journalism by offering them some training on journalistic ethics and how to go about, you know, uh, uh, fact-checking and mm -hmm. news. And it mm -hmm. is, like you said, I agree, it is the basic responsibility of a journalist to fact-check yeah. before they release anything out there. If and are we, we foregoing that role as journalists? If yes, there is laziness. There is laziness in journalism yeah, today. Uh, much, a lot of laziness in journalism today. Somebody yeah. just wants to write a piece, a raka raka, then they send it out there. And if you look at most print uh, news today, it has only one source. Normally it is a requirement that you have at least two sources. Mm -hmm. You don't want two sources, or then you have a good corroboration. I mean, and we are talking about media being, the, the, you know, having the, bearing the biggest responsibility mm -hmm. in spreading the truth. You seemingly spoke my mind on the question of sources. Mm -hmm. We often have a caveat of according to sources, yeah. sources preview to yeah. TV47, for instance, was in touch with someone mm -hmm. who is a source. Mm -hmm. And many a times we find these sources at times are misleading. Mm -hmm. In the event that this source has misled you, mm -hmm. what should a media house do? Just yeah. issue a correction. Issue a correction. Mm -hmm. But yes. I never do. I, I, we were talking about the Stone Asi. Remember the Stone Asi story where media last year, well, after the immediate of the swearing in of uh, the mock swearing in mm -hmm. of the then former prime minister, mm -hmm. that there was a, a, a headline from the nation that uh, Raila will not go to Stone Asi to meet the other principals. But and he was there. That was never corrected. But he went. Raila mm -hmm. went the following. Mm -hmm. they, they never corrected that. Mm -hmm. Secondly, there is a story that we followed up last year in 2018 when we are doing the, 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 some fake news, uh, serious fake news project, now mm -hmm. we are a little bit limited. Mm -hmm. We followed up a story in Mwingi where every news channel that we know today reported that irate youth set uh, pro-box 
a charcoal carrying pro box on, on fire, fire that yeah. the driver had to escape. Mm. And then we started asking questions. You look at the video clip, you can clearly see that these people are, are not even interested in the pro box. Some of them are even stealing the charcoal. Mm -hmm. So we send our team to the field to check. Mm. Fair and enough. And, and what criteria then should be used to deceive what you are getting from a source? I mean, um, uh, in terms of fact-checking, eh? Yes. I, I mean, I, I think most media houses have invested in uh, various approaches. Yeah. But for, for us, Media Council, uh, if we have picked an issue uh, from uh, a news, you know, a media, then we send people to the ground to confirm, or we make calls. Mm -hmm. We start with the editor, the mm -hmm. news, uh, the reporter, and then we ask, how did you come about this information? And then from there, we are able to build a story and do a report. Yeah. And in most cases, of course, if it's a serious thing, then you end up getting a letter from the media council, or we encourage the aggrieved parties to report to the complaints commission, which is a you know an arm of the media council. Uh, yes. Just to just to mention something on sources. Um, when a journalist is getting sources confidential sources. Many a time, if they are trying to expose something that someone powerful would want to keep hidden, there are real consequences yeah. if the identity of that source is leaked. People lose jobs or worse. So if a journalist you know, uses a source to tell a story, that it is very important for the trust of that journalist that the identity of that source be kept Secret. Secret. Mm -hmm. However, uh, in this case, the journalist's editor with whom he's publishing that story may know the identity of that person. Yeah. So we won't tell the public, but as editors we know who that source is. And because it, it, it can get to a point where, um, as a journalist, it would be very difficult for you to practice journalism. If the people you're speaking to out there know, that if I tell you something secret, you're going to expose me. Mm -hmm. No one will tell you anything. You won't be able to work. On the flip side, um, when you talk about uh, when you talk about you know uh, using using sources, um, if a source is also not credible, people also have to remember that journalists also talk. So if you're a source and you set me up, I'm also going to tell my friends, this person set me up. Mm. And they also won't trust you. It's very important. So it calls for a bit of honesty on both sides. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to let my colleagues be beaten by someone misleading them, right? So um, sources, on one hand, should also be telling the truth and not misleading journalists. And, uh, and we see this particularly where, you know, if powerful people say, you know, maybe government officials want to discredit journalists. Mm -hmm. Because we see that happening. They will put something false mm. that looks good just to purposely mislead you. Exactly. And, yeah. and, and one of the most prominent cases was of, of the US journalist, Dan Rather, if, if you remember that story, mm -hmm. where he wrote a story about how US President George W. Bush had not served in the military as claimed. And what ended up creating a problem was the documents that were supposed to have exposed George Bush were written in a font that did not exist when George Bush was serving in war. Mm. And they missed this completely. And that really hurt his credibility. Mm. Sometimes these traps are laid for you. Yeah. Okay. As a journalist? Yes. As a journalist, they deliberately yeah. put traps for you. They feed you the wrong thing. Mm. So if you're not very fastidious about checking, mm -hmm. this is one way your credibility could be, uh, could be hurt. And, 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 and we need to remember also that mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about, um, when you talk about uh, the credibility of journalism, a lot of times what people in power want to do, and we see it with Donald Trump, we see it with uh, uh, Rodrigo Duterte, mm -hmm. They want to make everything fake news. Well, and we'll come to that a little yes. bit later. For the mm. better part of this discussion, we have talked about mm. uh, the conduit of this information, which is the media. Yeah. Let's get to the public, the mm. audience mm -hmm. of this information. Mm. Do you, as uh, Eric, think that there is enough media literacy in as far as the consumption of news and information from the media mm. is concerned? I genuinely don't think so. 
Like, I would just have to look at my family WhatsApp group and I would know <laughs> for a fact that some of the things that people are sharing and claiming to be factual information is actually... Forwarded as received. Yes. Mm -hmm. And because we see, uh, uh, like I mentioned initially, that we're getting to a point where the way we're consuming news is changing. So we don't have the gatekeepers we used to have, where you would, for example, get a newspaper editor mm -hmm. and a journalist that they do the story and then you wait for the paper in the morning mm -hmm. but now a story will break and then it's already on Twitter in mm -hmm. within seconds and then it's already on Facebook there's a live video and, and everything and if I have the capacity to post whatever I want yeah in, in, a, in a space that is largely loosely regulated yeah why should I be not posting that information because at <laughs> some level you need to be accountable for the stuff that you're putting online. As an individual? Yes. yes. Because I don't think we're at the point where we are responsible consumers of media. And one of the things as, that's actually led to the spread of misinformation is the fact that we just consume things without questioning them. And there's a lot of really easy to use tools that we try to share with people. For example, if someone sends you a photo mm -hmm. and claims that this was taken at a particular location, and then you do a reverse image search, that's where you go on a, on a search engine and then put in that image, and then it tells you any previous instance that that image has appeared. That's one way to quickly verify if an image is legitimate. Mm -hmm. And then another thing that we're seeing is stories that tend to appeal to our biases, we are far more likely to believe them. So for example, if I am a strong supporter of party A, and then a story breaks that some candidate belonging to party A has done something, they've done something fantastic, they've done something good, and I really want to believe that story, but it's not true, and I haven't taken the time to check it, I'm far more likely to share it. And then another thing that we see a lot of people doing is not actually opening links on tweets. So you see a tweet that says something with a link attached to it, mm -hmm. and then you, you share, share the link without knowing what really is. There. Yeah, and then it just cascades. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a lot of uh, there's a real need for media literacy, and one of the things that we're, we're trying to do with some of the media organisations we're working with is trying to get them to sort of give their audiences a way to give them this feedback. Like we have seen a story, and then we want you to check because we trust you as journalists to verify it. But then if these same journalists are the ones sharing these fake stories without checking them, then that's where the trust is lost. Yeah, let me ask you the same question yes. on media literacy. Mm -hmm. Are the audiences really media literate? Um, I will answer that at two levels. Um, because media literacy is, uh, is more than content. And media literacy is also involves using this gadget. Mm -hmm. And if yeah. you're capable of using this gadget mm -hmm. and uh, forwarding mm -hmm. information like you say, mm -hmm. then you're media literate. But if you are this gadget and you, you are unable to... Uh, you are media literate despite forwarding uh, misinformation? Yes, you are, you are media literate at that level. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to content, you are, one, unable to manufacture content. Uh, secondly, you are unable to understand, comprehend content that is shared with you. Mm. And finally, you are unable to understand the impact of the content that you are sharing among the communities, then you are immediately media illiterate. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there is need for education in that regard. Mm -hmm. But we have so seen pi we pictures, pictures that would otherwise not be shared by someone with their own common sense. It's mm -hmm. been shared by people who write flashy languages. Yes. Yes, and that's, 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 that's where you need now to come and sit down with the, with the public and educate them mm. on how to really understand some of these informations, what is fake and what is not fake, mm. what is propaganda and what is fake news, mm. you know, and so on and so forth. So that there is also government, and where we are going, we are going to be seeing more news from government. Uh, and I'm saying this as an opinion, as my own opinion, mm -hmm. without fear. <laughs> Why? Why should we be getting <laughs> more news from the government? Now we're talking about the Big Four agenda. Yeah. In a way, we have to achieve that. That has, been, has to be achieved. And, and you can see that there is a, a, a certain way of nationalizing the, the resources mm -hmm. towards the center so that the Big Four agenda can mm -hmm. be you know, implemented. And therefore, you're going to see a lot, of, a lot of propaganda, a lot of information coming from the government mm -hmm. telling people, uh, you know, we have done this, we have done that. And we, you know, like it happened towards the 2013 and towards the 2017 elections. And mm -hmm. even after the 2017 elections, some of the pictures that we saw from uh, the, the various campaigns were false information. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, I'm just saying this as a way of warning um, uh, journalists out mm. there and, and, and news purveyors out there that we should expect this kind of propaganda. Big, the biggest propaganda everywhere across the globe is the government. Yeah. Um, fair enough, it's actually good to hear someone from the Media Council of Kenya <laughs> saying so. Mm. And on the same question. Um, I think we need to increase media literacy. We're still not there. Uh, for example, I'll give like an instance, we, we, something that we encountered. 
during this whole Huduma number registration thing, there was a lot of misinformation surrounding uh, the process. Mm -hmm. We debunked about eight claims on the same. And this misinformation was from the media itself or no, the state? The, the, I would say the public. It was not. There are some that was the state. Like two instances. Two instances were from people who are government officials. Um, the rest was just from social media. And you will find that people actually went, were pushed to go and get this because they saw this and they're like, wow, this is going to happen, I need to, without really understanding what the process entails. Mm -hmm. So we need to increase uh, media literacy because misinformation now is... And what will happen. increase in this media literacy entail? Um, in your own opinion, yes. you have to be the, the, the structured <laughs> MCT way of doing things. Like in this, um, what did I say? If I give an example of the Huduma number uh, example, uh, claims, the misinformation around it, some of them were claimed to come from a media house, a leading media house, and they were actually using the screenshots from that. And it got to a point where I was like, I reach out to them. This is now you're having like four screenshots in a week, and we are churning out content, but it still keeps coming. So I had to reach out to them and tell them, this is what we are encountering. Can you like do something about it? And they shared a tweet and told people, all this that has been shared is false. If you want factual information, follow us on our verified pages. So that will help when people know, if you want information from this organization, go look here, go look here. Despite at times, <laughs> Yes. And frequently seen mm. verified accounts as well posting fake news. Misinformation. Misinformation. Yeah, first of all, just to, to, to beef up what she said, you know, there's, there's misinformation yeah. Yeah. when you don't give false information Intention. with, with yeah. intentionally. Yeah. Then there's disinformation Dis yeah. when you actually make things up and concoct them yeah. and throw them out there. Mm -hmm. Okay? But uh, on the question of media literacy, I think it's, it has to start from the beginning. You know, you have to, you, you find often that people cannot distinguish between a news story and opinion. It's that basic, mm. right? So you will find someone who is just a columnist on Sunday and people <coughs> think he's a journalist. No, he has another day it's job, right? <laughs> but he's writing a column. Mm -hmm. So it starts from there. And then there is how you recognize that certain websites are set up to misinform. Mm. Because there are websites where people do nothing mm -hmm. but produce fake news. Yeah. They produce false news. Yeah. That, they're just doing that. Websites like that typically uh, pass themselves off as satire websites. Mm. So they are pretending that um, this uh, may, or may or may not be true. A lot of them do not have a physical address. You can't find them. Mm -hmm. Many of these websites pretend to be others. So they will do, they will play around with the, the web address of a common, uh, of a common uh, well-known TV station. So for example, you could go to, I could pretend to be TV 47, mm -hmm. and I call myself TV 47 dash Kenya, and I make that website. So I bring, and I, and I get your logo and I steal it. Everyone thinks they're coming to TV 47. And then I write whatever it is I'm writing, you get enough true stories. You get, you know, and then, but in among those true stories, you sneak in some false ones. Mm -hmm. A lot of websites are built like that. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be able to teach people how to recognize these websites, to go and be able to find, for example, uh, where their domain names are registered, right? If, if these are not people you can find then you know to be suspicious about all these things. Fair yeah. enough, you alluded to the point of a failure of distinction on whether one is a journalist or an opinion writer. Is it so because the information nearly almost is the same? No, I mean with, with, with the newspapers it's obvious, it's even labeled opinion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. So it's very clear, but you will find that often people uh, do not know how to verify that someone is a journalist, mm. which is to say that they are accredited by his people. Mm -hmm. Okay. The media council. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and also, I think we, we need to realize that, um, and I think Eric pointed this out, there is a world of tools yeah. that are free, that, every, that lots and lots of people can use 
to determine uh, whether information is true or false. I remember one one uh, instance where we, you know, there were these, you know, people who push hashtags. You know, one of these very popular hashtags mm -hmm. that was, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not sure it was a particular influencer, but a group of people, mm -hmm. and they were talking about how the Jubilee government had built infrastructure in Kiambu County and saying that, you know, they've built a sewage treatment plant in Kiambu town. And uh, they were showing this picture of this very impressive structure. And when we did, uh, when we started looking at it, the first thing we did was what he mentioned. We did a reverse image search mm -hmm. to find out if it had been published before. We found that that image had been used in very many places and the most common place where it had been used was India. So it wasn't even okay. from Kiambu. Yeah, it was from India. And uh -huh. so now the problem was, what we also found was, we went to the environmental assessment documents for these projects, and we were able to find the coordinates, latitude and longitude. And so we were able to look at satellite pictures to tell us what is actually on the ground in that place. And we found some structures, but they were very different from what was in the picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of these tools are there. You can find out uh, using social media uh, whether pictures have been photoshopped or not. Mm -hmm. um, you can find out, you know, uh, using, you know, whether, you know, you can, you can actually preserve some of these tweets that you see. If someone is lying on Twitter mm -hmm. and they want to, and, and they are being confronted, mm -hmm. and they want to delete it so that they can say, I didn't find it you can actually preserve that tweet forever so that you can show him that, yes, you said this. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Leo Vincent talks about thorough investigation using talk of satellite images, mm -hmm. getting mm -hmm. the actual pictures. Should mm -hmm. journalists be as thorough as that as well? They should. No, not journalists, media houses. Media it's, house. it's a media house to invest. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we're going to be discussing in the media summit next week is uh, media viability, media, general media sustainability. Mm -hmm. How to sustain media in Kenya in the era of the competing challenges that we are facing here, including fake news. Mm -hmm. and, and we are saying one of the arguments is that media houses need to invest in serious fact-checking desks. Mm -hmm. That is the beginning. And then you're going to bring on board all these other tools that he's talking about that are free. How they are. I think last time that the, uh, we, we also used to use some of these tools, including the Google, uh, mm. the reverse image, and, and, mm. and so on and so forth. And, mm. But, but I, I think we were just basic, modest, and everything. Yes. And mm. media houses can invest more, they make a lot of money, I want to believe, and, and therefore they can. Uh, they are capable of doing this. They make a lot of money despite the profits shrinking over, over the last decade. Yeah. F fair enough. Is, is, <laughs> is that discussion and, for another day? Okay. And the article I quoted earlier on, uh, on how Kenya is first becoming the latest victim of fake news, alluded to uh, the point of fake news being on the rise mm -hmm. during electioneering period. Mm -hmm. Is fake news then a political point scoring game? Um. I think so, because you will find, like, close to elections, people are pushing their own narrative, mm -hmm. and they will do whatever it takes to get to the top. And there's a lot of fake news also around that time. If you remember, just before the 2017 uh, general election, there was, like, a whole fake video reported to be from the BBC, showing that this politician will... No, is leading, well, is, sorry, is um, poised to win. And you can imagine how damaging that is during an election, given that things are very tense at that time. Mm -hmm. So you can't quite tell the origin of this. You will not know if it is a political camp doing this, if it is. It's very hard to tell, but it is very important for you to quickly correct that information. Like the, the BBC came out and said that it was not... Um, from them. There was also one from CNN. There was also one from Ipsos. There's a lot of like misinformation. Actually, that is just fake news because they, it is fabricated content. It does not mm. exist and they come to up suit with a it certain to, interest. Yeah, yeah, to cause it's panic uh, and you know, elicit emotions from <laughs> the public and push a certain narrative. Vincent? Um, and you know, it's, it's in, like in Kenya, elections are particularly important. But we have to be cognizant that it is not just around politics where this happens. Yes. It, in, in health, this is big, you know, where people say that if you drink this, you, it, this thing cures all the diseases. Mm -hmm. okay. Vaccines. Yes. 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 It, we have seen it, uh, Africa Check has 
checked very many claims around fake job ads. Ah. Oh. So you go, there are people online who will make a job advertisement. They'll tell you that it could be any big company that you can think of in Kenya. Supermarkets. Supermarket mm -hmm. chains, mm -hmm. mobile yeah, companies, yeah, yeah. breweries, mm -hmm. and they tell you that to be considered for this position, you need to MPESA as 350. Now, that should be warning people that, you know, because really anyone who tells you to pay anything for a job interface buying to you. But what we have seen is they get caught, they do it again with a new company. Mm -hmm. So today they say, oh, Kenya Ports Authority, the next day it's KRA. Mm -hmm. they, they do it again and again and again. And so what we have been able to do is to tell them, well, if you want to apply for a job, because we have spoken to very many employers about how, where they post their jobs, mm -hmm. that we have an official website or we post in the newspaper, or you can take it to our offices, okay? Our offices, our head offices, if it's a supermarket, take it to the branch and leave it there. So that empowers people who need employment and who are desperate so that they're not taken advantage of. Because the reason why we think these people are doing it again and again and again is because there must be some people who are actually paying that three fifty mm. for who are desperate enough and mm. who are doing that. Mm. So, uh, yeah, fact checking stretches to politics, but it, it's also bigger than that. Fair enough. I talked of politics because we clearly are equally seeing the trends. Mm. We live in Trumpism era, what scholars have called mm -hmm. as, as the generation of the term fake news being yeah. used. Yes. What, what then is the danger of a leader, for instance? attributing everything that is against him to be fake news, whereas in many cases, they are not. True. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the biggest, the first, uh, is that it's, it's misleading to journalism, and journalism are going to fall prey to this, and therefore you're going, um, and if you end up, you know, spreading, like I said, the, 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 the consequences are there of spreading fake news, spreading rumors, and, and gossip as a journalist, if you are credited, because we, ex we expect to hold you uh, with, at the, with the highest threshold, of um, uh, ethical standards. Uh, that's, that's one, and we saw um, some time back some governors were doing that. A uh, governor would today issue a statement, a rumor that we are going to be doing this, and when the media reports it, then they say, that was not us. Doesn't so, that have a backlash on the media as well? It In the event mm. that your audience are consuming an information that you reported yesterday, and you had a journalist at that place who reported what the governor, for instance, yes. said, and tomorrow he comes publicly to say that was fake news. Mm. It, it it does. But but you see now that is where people like us come in in journalism and fact checkers. You you have to it has to be part of your mission mm. to call out and debunk fake news. You don't let them get away with it. Mm. Okay. You put out a report that says the governor said this. It is not true. Here is the proof. Mm -hmm. And you have to do that consistently. And you have to do it on both sides of the political divide. Let's not be, we have to be non-partisan. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you have to do it on both sides. Yeah. But it is very important not to let people get away with it. So, yeah. and in, in Kenya, because we have seen, we have the president, deputy president, all these senior officials, we have 47 mm. governors, we have business leaders. At any one time, there are very many people who are making claims. We, if you, it is possible, a lot of these people speak on TV. So you can go to YouTube and verify the exact words he said. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. You can find... And the audience in this case, we are assuming, is already watching that TV with that yeah. bite of what they're yes. saying. Mm -hmm. So yes. So the thing is, but what you have done, because when you're fact-checking somebody like that, you need to establish for sure that he said that. Yeah. yeah? So you need to make sure that they cannot tell you, I was misquoted. Once you have done that, then you can now proceed to establish what the best available data and the best available expertise tell you about what was said that day. But you cannot let it go, because if it, if, cause now you will open yourself to accusations mm. that you're choosing to fact check politician A, and you're letting and politician B go. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that, that, that hurts your credibility. And then on, on top of what Vincent just said, one of the things that we keep seeing is especially in like hyper-partisan env uh, environments, like just before, just after elections, mm -hmm. a lot of the misinformation that comes in is tend uh, it tends to try to create outrage, and by doing that, people are distracted 
So instead of holding their leaders accountable, they're actually trying to fight each other because... And just to be clear, this information is coming from, is it the media or people who are driving their own agenda? It could, it, it's a lot of times it's from people who've been directed to share this information by some of these politicians mm -hmm. because they have an agenda in mind. And then because of that, because it's feeding this outrage machine and everyone is basically just shaking their fists all the time, the accountability bit where, like for example, we are meant to be participating in these decisions that are being made, it tends to get lost because there's all, all this noise and then the, the, the narrative is just being thrown around all over the place. And then the other thing that's happening is we're seeing journalists' lives being put in danger when uh, the, the stuff they're publishing is called fake news. Because one of the, the, the things that is happening like in Brazil or in the Philippines, for example, mm -hmm. is every time they publish something that the president disagrees with, he calls them out. And then he says, this journalist has published this story, and obviously they have an agenda against his government because we're doing such a good job. And in an era then, as such as it is, yeah. where disagreements apparently equate fake news, yeah. mm -hmm. how do media houses hold their heads high and say this is not fake news? Well, um, I think yes, they gave, partly gave um, an answer to that, a feedback, a very good feedback to that. We have an experience in Kericho mm -hmm. and experiences without even going to Brazil and Marsabit mm -hmm. just the other day, Ipse. Uh, TV yeah. is being accused by the county government of hate speech mm. and therefore the county government has been pushing uh, the closure yeah. of IPSE mm. uh, uh, radio. Mm. When you go to IPSE radio, they have all the clips, they have kept a backup of mm. everything that the governor and the county government has been saying over the period yeah. and therefore they have all the evidence that they can master uh, that we are being attacked for nothing. We just air what the governor says, but the governor is not happy because we there is a way they juxtapose yeah. what mm. is being said and what is being done, yeah. and therefore the government is unhappy about that. The same mm. thing with Kericho. A journalist published an, a story about the county government of Kericho about an issue that was uh, correct according to everybody else, but the governor was unhappy. So mm. what does the governor do? The governor calls the editor in Nairobi and tells the editor, "I need to fire this journalist, this reporter on the ground," and. The, the editor doesn't fire the reporter because the reporter has provided evidence that what they have is genuine. Yeah. And therefore now the governor resorts or the politicians resort to threats. At one point I think the reporter woke up to find somebody in a house, you know, holding a panga. They, she was lucky because there were more people who looked like her in the house. She was living with her sister and a maid and all that and therefore the guy got confused and then they, you know. So, so it's, 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 it's here in Kenya and these are things that we investigate. It's, it's fake news, it, it, it's, it's having impact in, mm -hmm. the, in our very own journalism, in our very own society mm -hmm. where we are living in. And today. when leaders are quick to dispel any information that does not suit them as fake news, mm -hmm. and they sway audience, and they have audiences that religiously follow them, mm -hmm. clearly that as well talks of the message getting a misinterpretation midway to the audience. I mean, this is, this is why we were saying that we have to be careful about this label, fake news. Yeah because of the ease with which people, even politicians, mm -hmm. can be attached to everything. Yeah. So a journalist made a genuine mistake, fake news, mm. okay? And then you are, so you're putting everything together, mm. which is obviously not correct and not the right thing to do. So we have to be able to fight, journalists have to be able to fight for that and say that it is not fair and it is not accurate of you to call this Fake news. news. Yeah. You have to fight back. You have to show the evidence of how we got our stories mm. and say these are the steps that we took mm. to get these stories. And then we have to contact the people making these claims. A big part of disinformation and fake news is that people are hiding behind websites. They are anonymous online. Mm -hmm. You don't know who they are. Whether it is those people who are anonymous online or even politicians, mm -hmm. you have to contact them. Mm. Yeah, you have to contact them so that they know, right, that, you know, they were contacted and they can't say that I never spoke to that person before. Yeah. It's very, that's a very, very mm. important person of, a very important part of accountability, reaching out to the person who said whatever they said. And also when it comes to, you know, fighting this, I think it is very important to acknowledge that, you know, there has been some progress right now there are actually certain high technology tools that can speed up the process of fact checking mm -hmm. and that can automate them. Um, recently at the, the Global Fact Six conference, we were looking at tools that automate the fact checking process. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a politician here and I am talking, okay, there is 
a program, mm -hmm. technology, that will listen to what I'm saying, will transcribe it transcribe, yeah. into words, mm -hmm. and using uh, that technology, it can identify a claim there, mm -hmm. and lift it out, mm -hmm. and from a database, pull out the relevant information, mm -hmm. and say true or false. And apart Some from of these fact checkers there, like mm -hmm. you and, mm -hmm. and uh, Leo, uh, Eric and Anne, is traditional media, the normal yes. TV and the newspapers, are they ready for that rigorous process? I should think so, because I believe fact checking is actually like a fundamental part of journalism. So, even when it entails matching satellite images. Yeah. Like, there's been, yes. um, <laughs> there was actually a documentary by the BBC <laughs> about how they were able to track. Uh, I think Should it was in South Sudan? It was in Sudan. Sudan. It was Cameroon. Cameroon. Yeah, they've done one about South Sudan, but the, the, the really, uh, they showed how they were able to track the location of that specific shooting to Cameroon by tracking the hills on Google Maps mm -hmm. and then trying to figure out from the shadows what time of day it happened. And like they went through the whole process of explaining how they figured out the, where the shooting happened and who was doing the shooting. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is literally just investigative journalism. And at some level, because all of this data that we use in our fact checks is publicly available, we don't make any data of, on, on our own. So if, for example, a governor says, we haven't been able to build a school because we haven't gotten money from the central government, you actually have Treasury publishing a record of how much money they've been dispersing to the counties. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's up to the journalists producing these stories to ask these questions. Like, if you have a one-on-one, -on -one, because media houses generally have a lot more access to politicians than we do. Try as we may. So if they actually want to hold politicians to account, this information is available. So it's basically just good old journalism, asking these questions and then getting data and mm -hmm. then saying, you lied about this and this. And it's like all of the tools that we've used in our work, we share them. Like as Vincent said, we have fair, a requirement fair. to make our methodology transparent. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. And in a media landscape that mm -hmm. is continuously cutting on cost, mm -hmm. laying off people just so that others pl play double, triple roles. <laughs> is the media in <laughs> Kenya, for instance, really ready for that? I don't think you have a choice. You have to embrace fact checking. You have to embrace verification for your brand to stand. Because I think the minute you publish something and then it turns out to be false, it takes a hit. You will take a hit as an organization. When people start saying, ah, these ones are just, you know, even the other day they had posted a fake thing. It really is damaging. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very important. Yeah, it is tedious. It is a lengthy process. But the product that you put out there is so good because you even explain the methodology as they have mentioned. Mm -hmm. When we do our fact check articles, you will put the claim and then you will explain how you have arrived at that rating and show all the data that you have used. The same with the BBC clip, they showed how they have, they verified that this was not, because it was Cameroon and I can't remember the other country that people were claiming the shooting happened, mm -hmm. but they showed step by step, step by step, the th tools they used to come to the conclusion that this happened in Cameroon. You do not have a choice. You have and to I, And I'm not this. questioning the practicality <laughs> yes. of matching the images, <laughs> digging mm. deeper to find yes. what the truth is. Mm. I'm just questioning whether the media mm. is, is really ready in terms of investment. It makes business sense. Yes. It makes business sense. Yes. Yeah. I, I think yeah, because that. the consequences yeah. are... Yeah. Rather than the yeah. bites of <coughs> Leo said this, Abu Bakr said this, mm. and the, you said this, yeah. get the story out of that. The consequences mm. of yeah. failing to debunk are more, you know, mm -hmm. than, uh, you know, investing in fact-checking. Mm -hmm. I mean, like she's saying, there is no choice. And I think media houses, you're able, you're capable of putting up a media house, a TV station like this, one. you should be able to invest yeah. I mean, in human resources. Yeah. In, it doesn't in take basic technology too much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, let me mention a couple of things that can really help any media house, if you're looking to fact-check. Mm -hmm. The first is the, the quality of your sources and online holdings. I think that it would be a good thing for any media house to invest in getting their journalists access to online journals. Yeah. Okay, so science, technology, all those journal articles, so that you can be able to read the latest research. That's number one. Mm -hmm. If you can do that, you will help a lot. Number two, it's important in the fact-checking business, I think with, as with any journalism, to recognize the limits of your knowledge. And I think this is something that 
every journalist has to recognize that I'm going to do a business story, but I'm not a specialized labor economist. That I'm writing a health story, but I'm not a doctor. Mm -hmm. That I am writing um, a story on security, but I'm not an expert criminal lawyer or policeman or soldier. And so we have to attach ourselves to expertise. So we have to be very careful about one, how you identify someone is actually an expert. Mm. Okay? So because we clearly have many in in the big yes. title of yeah. being an, analyst, <laughs> an expert on an this expert and that. In this, yes. Yeah. So if they are talking about you know economics, what economic qualifications do they have? If you're talking about medicine, what medical mm. qualifications do they have? Mm -hmm. Do they publish work in this field? Do they consult in this field? Do they write in that field? And so these are people whom you can ask questions that are complicated. They are people whom. Uh, can actually interpret data for you. It's very important when you're choosing an expert, though, obviously, to look at the affiliation, mm -hmm. and find out who do they work for, who is paying them, mm -hmm. because that obviously influences the kind of information they mm -hmm. can give you. If you know more than one expert, even the better for you. You can ask this expert, and you can ask this expert the same question. Fair, fair enough, Leo, yeah. before yeah. you interject yeah. on that yeah. point, isn't it not the society's expectation, the audience's expectations, many at times, that journalists should know it all? It is. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. it is. And the media is called the watchdog of the society. Yeah. And therefore, for you to be the watchdog, you have to know. Um, you have to know a lot if you can know everything. And the issue of specialization comes in here so that even the media house, when they're hiring a reporter or hiring somebody to work in the judiciary, they're hiring somebody who understands how the judiciary works. Mm -hmm. And if they don't understand, they take them through a training. Mm -hmm. The same thing when you have somebody reporting in agriculture, in any environment, this specialization also has to be seen in the kind of journalists that we, have, we work with, so that we stop, uh, the institutions that train journalists also stop training just journalists as journalists. Mm -hmm. and general not, journalists, general report journalism, on everything. So that you start specializing yes. in yeah. aspects of how do you report environment, for mm -hmm. example, how do you access information on environment, mm -hmm. and also creating working relationship with various ministries and mm. various departments. Yes. The, the Kenya uh, National Bureau of Statistics is a very necessary entity in this regard mm. yes. and, 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 other, and other sources. Mm. And by the way, there is a comment I made about uh, Kericho and uh, Bomet. I just want to issue a disclaimer that mm. I'm not accusing anybody. Fair enough, it's always good to take back your word. Yeah. Yeah. Still on <laughs> Less it gets mistranslated. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, we have talked of fake news. How then do we curb fake news? understand we have close to six, seven minutes to end the conversation. Yeah. How do we curb fake news? Um, well, first, the first thing we have to do is, uh, if we cannot, uh, is to ask for evidence, always, um, to reach out to fact checkers. <laughs> who can like you. Yes, <laughs> who, can, who can help, <laughs> who can definitely help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and to be more circumspect about spreading information. Yeah. yeah if, if you think, if you're not sure, if you don't know the evidence standing behind something, mm -hmm. then don't spread it. Even if it's your family, even if it's your friend, even if it sounds funny, don't, don't say Even it. when the temptation of breaking that news, yeah. getting that information yes. first yeah. is concerned. Yes, mm -hmm. hang on to it. Don't send it. In fact, what you should do is re hit reply to the person who sent it to you. Hit reply, don't forward, hit reply mm -hmm. and ask, do you have evidence? Mm. Where did you get this? Yeah. Fair enough. Eric? I think on the side of like, uh, audiences, we have to be a lot more conscious about how we consume the news. And then we also have to slow down the speed at which we consume information. Because a lot of times, we just skim through things, and then because we generally agree with them, that's when we try to share them, or we try to send them out. So if we now start asking the questions that Vincent has mentioned, where is this information from? Who has it cited? Where was it published? And what does it make me feel? That way we can be a lot more responsible when it comes to sharing this information. And then the other thing is to call people out when they share things and then they try to hide behind forwarded as received. Because that's being irresponsible. Mm -hmm. You're trying to outsource that responsibility for this information. But sometimes because you're sharing this information without checking, it can go out and then cause some damage. And then, then when it comes to the production of the news, we, we need to move away from you want to be the first one to break a story. You want to actually... But isn't, isn't that the glamour of being a media house, wanting to break it? If you break a story it and then you're wrong, mm -hmm. you will have to eat a lot of humble pie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then what I'm saying is uh, when it comes to production of, of the news, like we have to be a lot more 
conscious again, a lot more responsible about who we're asking mm -hmm. and what questions we're asking. And yeah, to add on to what they've said, I think it's also very important for journalists and media to get the information straight from the source, like have primary sources of data or information. We have instances where someone has published an article because it appeared on this other publication, which is a mainstream publication, so you're like, ah, if they have shared this information, then it is accurate. Then it turns out to be false. Then you, know, you have a problem. Why, why is, you know, it was shared by these people, so we thought it was right. It, <laughs> we use them as a source. So it's very important for us to get credible sources, get the information from the primary source. Yeah. Leo, your final thoughts on the same? Yes, uh, curbing fake news and uh, the spread of it. Um, the first thing is train, train and more training, especially for journalists and editors and everybody who is involved in it. Anyone who actually who is involved in any news gathering, whether he's a cameraman, he's a comedian, you know, anyone who appears in a studio to talk about anything or to, you know, project that in the camera. Tra train more than so what's just given in the schools and yes, media schools? Targeted training mm -hmm. for journalists because mm -hmm. journalists are not trained about how to debunk fake news. Mm -hmm. You know, so that they're exposed to these tools that uh, uh, they has been talking about here and, and Eric. Yeah. And then the second thing is education, targeting to the targeted to the public, and that's why we have been talking about media information and literacy. And finally, the biggest one is partnerships and collaborations between entities and organisations and institutions that are involved in uh, you know fake news and debunking and so on and so forth. I think that would move us uh, forward. And that's where we'll have to end this discussion, Leo Mutisia from the Media Council of Kenya. Thank you for making time for us. And Gengeri. Yes. I hope I got your name yes. right now. No, the Deputy Director, Pesa che Deputy Editor, rather, Pesa Cech, Eric Mugendi to my immediate left. And uh, who is the Managing Editor, Pesa Cech, Vincent Ngethe, the Deputy Editor, Kenya, Africa Czech. Thank you. Lady and gentlemen, many thanks for making time for us. Thank you for having well, us. That brings us to the end of today's edition of Newsroom. Remember, the topic of discussion, just as a reminder, has been debunking fake news. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Up next is Matukio Nyanjani with Paul Kirobi. Don't go too far.